Thank you very much. We are here to bring you the story behind the music you love and to introduce you to the men who make that music at Orchestra Hall. You'll also get to hear an informal and easy-to-understand discussion of music and its interesting personalities. And what's more, you, listening right now, have an opportunity to win two main floor tickets to a concert by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And now let's turn to the page in your symphony scrapbook that tells about the, oh, we might call it the tenor or the soprano of the brass choir, the trumpet. And we have with us Mr. William Babcock, member of the trumpet section of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Mr. Babcock, I'm sure our listeners would like to have you identify the selection you played at the beginning and perhaps give us the pleasure of hearing some more from that composition. Surely, Mr. Kuiper. That was the dance of the ballerina from the ballet Petrushka by Igor Stravinsky. Recently, in reading um, a book on orchestral instruments, um, I ran across a statement that uh, we usually don't uh, take into consideration uh, enough, we people who are interested in symphony orchestra, of what the uh, jazz player has long known, that there are many trumpet mutes available and that uh, each one imparts a different type of uh, color or uh, volume. And I was wondering if you could say something about the uh, use of the mute in the symphony orchestra. Um, Well, mutes are are used to impart a different timbre of tone to the brass instruments. And uh, they uh, also are are used in in certain instances to make the instrument uh, softer. An example of that is a piece we've done recently called the uh, Festivals from Nocturnes by Claude Debussy in which the whisper mute is is employed. This is about the the softest mute that the trumpet player uses. I was wondering if you could play the passage first without the mute so our listeners can hear what it would sound like under those conditions. And uh, then uh, with the mute, is that possible or reverse it? Well, uh, the way it occurs in the piece is that uh, it's played with the mute first and then open. All right. Which, of course, gives the effect that the composer was uh, striving for of the uh, trumpet sound in the distance. Exactly. Firstly, uh, a jazz uh, player has half a dozen or more different types of mutes, doesn't he? I yes, wonder why we don't right. use those in uh, symphonic compositions. Does, does, well, the, uh, does the modern composer use more of them? Yes, the modern composer does use more. In fact, I, I believe that we do use, uh, in one composition or another now, in symphonic music, all the mutes that uh, the jazz player uses. Oh, I think people usually think of the... Uh, Trumpet is sort of an open air instrument uh, used mainly for fanfares, tone having a certain bracing uh, quality. And of course, those who are interested in symphonic <clears throat> work know that uh, that's only one type of effect. Uh, there's also the uh, use of the trumpet in lyric passages, frequently for solo use. I was wondering if um, 
you could illustrate those two different types, those two different effects. Well, yes, then the, uh, the fanfare type, uh, I would like to play trumpet tune, which is a piece for organ and trumpet by Henry Purcell. And then I'll follow that with a solo from the fourth movement of the Masquerade Suite by Cacciatorian. Two days ago, a letter arrived in the uh, Symphony Hall office addressed to the first cornet player of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and it uh, uh, gave us a laugh, uh, because that's uh, not an, a term we usually use in connection with um, the Symphony Orchestra. Now, I've heard it said that the, uh, the French school favors the uh, uh, cornet, and someone is uh, once told me that uh, we were rather snob snobbish in banishing it from the American uh, uh, symphony scene. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, uh, that that we in America have banished it from the symphony scene uh, is not true. So long as we continue to uh, to use it in compositions which we play, and. Uh, there are many, many compositions written in which the uh, conductors uh, specifically insist that we use the cornet because it does have a definite, uh, definitely different quality of tone. But isn't it true that uh, in this country we usually associate it with uh, uh, cheaper music, uh, cheaper atmosphere? Well, uh, yes, I, I believe that that, uh, to a certain extent, is true if... Uh, well, if you want to call uh, cornet soloists and things of that type of a band nature of a cheaper quality. I think that's what we usually think of it as the, uh, remember the, the band coming out and playing a very florid uh, cornet uh, uh, solo. Um, is there, you mentioned that the uh, symphonic writers have used it very frequently. Uh, could you name some of these works? <coughs> well, uh, that the, the selection that I played... Uh, the beginning, uh, Dance of the Bar Ballerina from uh, Petrushka, is a cornet solo. It's usually played by the uh, by the third player of the orchestra on a cornet, if if the conductor so desires. I played it on a trumpet today. And another piece uh, which I could play would be the uh, March to the Scaffold from the Fantastic Symphony by Berlioz. I think we'd like to hear that now. talking with a, another brass player of the orchestra this morning, and we were talking about uh, solo work, and uh, he made the uh, statement that um, when you uh, come up to the stage for a concert and you know there's a 
symphony being played in uh, which you have a solo uh, passage, you just have to steel yourself to come up to it and just take it. And uh, it was it was quite a strain. Do all brass players feel that way? Well, to a certain extent, yes. Our nerves are put to quite a test. Uh, when we play, if a mistake is made, it's heard all over the place. There's no two ways about it. And I think that that contributes to the uh, general effect uh, on the nerves before playing. It's either very good or very bad. Well, that's about uh, in other words. It. Yes, sir. Well, now, um, when you're getting ready for a, uh, a concert, say, downstairs before you come on the uh, stage, uh, what sort of material do you use? I'm asking as a personal question, uh, to uh, get lips and lungs and instrument fingers all in uh, shape for the ordeal that's coming up. Well, it's uh, I personally usually play a series of long tones. That is a single long tone with a crescendo and decrescendo in it, and uh, legato scales and staccato scales, and uh, well, uh, various different types of tonguing and so forth. Uh, just a, a representation of all the techniques. But um, nothing definitely associated with the, um, the passages you're about to play. Well, no. Uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, not a good idea to to uh, play something that you're going to play up on the stage just before you go. I think it calls your attention to it. If there's anything difficult in it, it uh, sort of prompts your mind. Uh, I would pre personally prefer to stay away from anything I'm going to play on the stage. Well, thanks ever so much, Mr. Babcock, for a very interesting discussion and performance on that instrument. Now we're happy to send a pair of tickets to Mr. Horace Kuhn to a concert of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra for his anecdote. It's about the famous pianist Mortitz Rosenthal, who was noted for his biting wit, and one day he called on a fellow pianist whom he did not like very much. The maid asked him to wait in the parlor, and he did so impatiently. After some time, the pianist came out of his music room and greeted Rosenthal. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, he said. I've been playing the minute waltz. So I noticed, Rosenthal replied it bitingly, for the last ten minutes. And thanks, Mr. Kuhn, for his interesting anecdote.